I told I told the story um, a few weeks ago on a Sunday morning. We had somewhere to go, and so a lot of times we'll go also to a service on a Sunday. And that Sunday we didn't. We had somewhere to go, family time we were doing, and uh, we get about halfway there, and Annabeth goes, "Daddy, are we going to church this morning?" And I said, "Well, no, baby. We were at church last night. We're doing family time." And she goes, "Oh, I wanted to learn more about Jesus." Let me tell you, <laughs> I. If it wasn't too far away, I wanted to spin that car right around, but um, you never know where God's word, whose heart will land on just for you, right? Even at the mouth of babes. It's amazing. So welcome everybody here to Refuge Church this evening. I'm so glad that you're all with us today. <clears throat> um, so we're starting a new series this week, and we're starting a series I'm calling The Blueprint to the Church, and it's the Seven Churches of Revelation, and a lot of times we talk about Revelation, and uh, we're going in a little bit different direction, usually. Um, but this time I want to take these seven churches um, for a reason. And so I guess we can ask, why is this blueprint important for us today? Um, these churches that are in Revelation, right? So a lot of people ask, well, isn't this end of the world type stuff? Or, you know, does that really apply now? And I'm going to say yes. Yes, I think it does. Um, I don't claim, and I'll never claim to know the day or the hour in which Christ is coming back, so I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint, but I don't know. Um, as well as anybody that tells you they know, they don't know either. Um, so getting into this, I do believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are alive and well in 2022, and I believe that they are active in our world. As well as prophecy, don't get me wrong, I believe people can definitely prophesy today. But in Matthew 24, Jesus tells us, but about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So do I believe that these gifts exist? Yes, I do. But I don't believe the Lord telling me trumps him telling Jesus. Um, I believe if anybody's going to know the day or hour, it's going to be the Son more than it's going to be anyone. So anybody that tells you that they know, just trust that they, they truly don't know. So what does it do for us? What does this blueprint do? What is looking at um, each one of these churches and seeing how, uh, how they operated and what Jesus' words to them were, what does that do for us? Well, it provides parameters, just like any blueprint, right? When you're constructing a building or you're putting together anything, you have a plan. You have uh, guidelines, parameters, a design that is in place, right? Could you... Uh, move away from that design? Absolutely. You're not going to get what you design, but you're more than free to go and do whatever you like. So this gives us that design. So it's the desired result, right? So what is the desired result of church? What is Jesus' plan for his church on this earth from the time he was here and before all the way up to 2022 and beyond. And we know that, right? God tells us he's not a God of confusion. He puts it right in his book, what his plan for the church is. We know it as the Great Commission. That is our mission. That is what Jesus told us as a church that he wants us to accomplish before he comes back. And what does that Great Commission tell us? I know you're probably thinking, Mark, what does the Great Commission have to do with the seven churches of the Revelation? Now, we'll get there. So in the Great Commission, Matthew, um, in, 20, in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, he tells his version of the Great Commission. And Matthew's point in his version of this Great Commission, or how he understood it, and from his own perspective and life experience, spending with Jesus and the other disciples, he was, his message proclaims the identity of Jesus. And if you listen, it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so you see these ideas of identity. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's him saying, that's who I am. I have the authority over heaven and earth. That I am who my father says I am, just like we are who he says we are. 
And so Matthew really settles on the identity of Christ. Another thing we can pull out of there, Jesus says, I have commanded you. He's not commanding you unless he has authority over you. I am with you always. There's only one that can be with us always, and that is the um, all-present God. And he is the only one. So there again, his identity and just to make a note of it, a lot of people quote the scripture and they say, well, I'm with you always till the very end of the age. That's not what Christ says. He says, I'm with you to the end, in the end, through the end, after the end, not till the end. He doesn't walk away once the end comes. He's right there with us, through us, right? Now we move on to Mark, and in chapter 16 of Mark, he takes and he proclaims the power of Jesus in the Great Commission. He says, it says to, him, to them in verse 15, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. But here it is in verse 17. This is the, the meat of what Mark is doing here. He says, And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. It's talking about the power of Jesus. Right? Scripture tells us not just the power that Jesus has, but it's the power of the name of Jesus. Just his name strikes power. It, in, it invokes a divine power like no other. It continues in verse 19 of Mark. It says that after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. And in verse 20, it confirms for us that the disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. The power of Jesus. We move on to Luke 24. And Luke who was a medical doctor, um, details mattered to Luke. Accuracy mattered to Luke. Um, Luke was not wrapped up in the mysticism or the mystery so much. He was a medical doctor. He wanted to know the truth. He was in it to say, hey, you know, let's, let's strip away the mystery and see, hey, according to truth and according to this and according to med medical science, and what are we talking about here, right? He gives us this perspective. The interesting thing, Mark is usually the less wordy one. Mark is right down to the point. Let me just get to the point and get out of here, right? Luke's more the wordy one, getting all the details right, and it's flip-flopped. Mark had this long message about the power of God, and Luke gives us a power graph where he reveals the plan of action. Who is the message for? How are we supposed to push this message into the world and throughout? Right? And he tells us in Luke 24, verse 45, it says, Then he opened their minds... So they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what I it was written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem. Right? So we spoke a little bit last week, maybe the week before, about being in our holy huddles. We need to break. The holy hug, right? Break out of our Christian cliques, right? Where it's safe and it's comfortable. And behind these doors, we don't have to worry about the stresses and the dangers and, and those that are outside that might come in and, and what will we do to handle the rain. In 2022, those are very real fears. Those are really very, very real dangers. But Jesus doesn't tell us to sit in the church with the doors shut so that we're not in danger. In fact, he tells us we will be persecuted. He tells us we will go through a journey that is not for the light of heart so much, but as I said last week, right, his yoke, you put it on him because his yoke is easy. And the burden's light when he's involved. So we open the doors and we proclaim to all the nations. And he goes on to say, you are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from our mind. So he gives us the plan of action. And then we come to John. John, the disciple of love. Right? And as I have spoke about, it's 
funny the change that happens in John because remember John was one of the sons of thunder, right? Calling fire down on those that wouldn't give him a sandwich, right? And then John turns into the disciple of love. He preaches about God's love, his reckless love. And in John 20, 30 through 31, he provides the evidence for who Jesus is, as Matthew stated, for the power he has, as Mark told us, and for whom he came to save, as Luke let us know in the Great in his interpretation of the Great Commissioner. Or not interpretation, but where did he land? Where did he settle? Where did he want us to, to kind of marinate on the Great Commission? And John tells us, starting in verse 30, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, talking about that witness, right? Witnesses, which are not recorded in this book. So John says, take what I'm telling you. There's three more books to go through and more to find out what all the other disciples may have witnessed. But here's my witness. We call that a testimony, right? Because we each have a witness for Christ, which is directly or directly affects our great commission into our own personal mission field. So John tells us, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Others put it, or may continue to believe. I like that. Because Sometimes we're not just reaching those who haven't found Christ yet. Sometimes we're reaching those that lost sight of Christ. Or maybe they just ran into a point of unsureness. Or maybe they just got off track or disappointed. Or so many times the people in the church discourage someone from coming back. But the, the important part isn't those that sit in the pews. The important part is the one that, who is being worshipped from the pew. And that's who needs to keep you in your seat and keep you coming back through the door. There's an old story, and it goes that somebody had invited a friend to church, and he had said, there's too many hypocrites in the church for me to be there. And his friend said, great, we have room for one more. We all can be kind of hypocritical in our daily lives. So this is our mission objective from our king. Right? The idea of monarchy is kind of fresh in our brains right now the passing of Queen Elizabeth, who was a staunch Christian, who believed in the power of Christ, who believed in the power of the name of Jesus. And so, with this idea fresh in our minds, maybe we can lean back to this idea that our mission objective is from our King. This is what He is asking of us as His followers, right? Believers. Remember that believe, to believe something is more than just accepting something as a fact. That you just accept it's true. That's not believing in something. That's just accepting something, right? But Christ calls us to believe in him. And belief is putting what we accept as fact into action. Right? We're reminded that without works, faith can be dead. Right? It's not that works get us into heaven, but what backs up the faith you have? What are you doing with your belief? Are we sitting on our holy huddle? Are we going through the doors? And pulling those in that can't see through their own darkness the lighthouse that is trying to direct them home. Right? As I've mentioned many times, and, and I'm sure you guys can repeat as I say this, are we the friends that tore apart a roof to drop their friend at the feet of Jesus? Or are we the friends that went, oh, that house is a little too packed today, let's try next week. Those friends are going to be healed, and you're going to be healed today because we believe, right? Jesus told them, I healed you because of your friend's belief, not the man's belief. And it was the friend's faith that helped cause that man to be at the feet of Jesus and be healed and to believe and to go forth, not crippled anymore, restored, reconciled. So another way to look at this, maybe to bring it out of Scripture, for anybody that might be watching the video um, and isn't familiar with these things, it's much like when you get out of bed in the morning, right? Does anybody stop? Well, some of us may stop before we get out of the bed in the morning and wonder if our knees are going to work that day. But normally, if we get out of bed, we stretch, 
we yawn, thank God maybe for another day, we swing our legs out of bed and we get up, we maybe hit the bathroom, go down and get coffee. Do we ever think our feet are just randomly not going to work? Of course not. We have faith that our feet and legs are going to work, they're going to get out of bed and we're going to go get coffee. Right? It's much the same thing. If we have faith in Christ, then let's get on our feet and walk out the door. We'll be sitting in the pew wondering, is he going to work in my life today? The answer is yes, yes he will. He'll work in your life today. He'll work in your life tomorrow. And when you're able to see through the clouds, you'll realize he worked in your life yesterday too. Even if you didn't know who he was. So getting to the letters of the seven churches. In a way, when we say the letters of the seven churches, it's kind of misleading. And that's because... In Revelation 1, Jesus tells John to write on a scroll, or you can translate, maybe some translations may say a book. Fun fact, if it wasn't for Christianity, we would not have books as we know them. We would still be working out of scrolls, uh, because that was the most popular thing of the day. And it was the Christians that decided to use a codex, or a book, what we know as a book today, to write all their stuff in. Because it was a lot less cumbersome than 5,000 scrolls that have been stored away that can be eaten by bugs, that can be dry rotted, right? Um, so we can thank Christianity for books. But it says here, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. To Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So all these churches knew exactly what the others were. And we'll get through that. So this tells us that all the churches were given every letter. Why? And this brings us to the whole point. So that was the intro. But here's what brings us to our point, right? Why would every church receive every other church's letter? And that's because Jesus' message to the churches wasn't just for them. It was for them. It was for every church around them. And it was for us today, and it was for the first century Christians and the second century Christians and the Christians in the 1600s who were going through the, the, the tumultuous time with uh, religious persecution. It was for everyone. It was a timeless message for the future church. That's us. We are the future church. We are the church that when Acts ends, we begin. And that's why it's important. And that's why every letter got sent to all the other churches. It was Jesus saying, hey, I may be talking about the issues in this church, but y'all better consider the issues so you don't fall into the same thing. And by the way, I'll get to your issues next. Right? It's not Jesus coming down and beating anybody over the head. He's just saying, hey, there's a bigger picture than what is held within one local church body. But it takes a network of churches. Refuge Church can't reach all of Mercer County. Refuge Church can't reach all of New Jersey. Robbinsville Baptist can't reach all of Mercer on their own. The Bridge can't reach all of Mercer on their own. Nobody can, right? It's a network of churches who learn and grow together from one another. And this is what we are doing. It's a blueprint for Jesus' church. It's his expectations of what we are as his body. Because remember, we're not our own, like our song said, right? This is not where I belong. That's why we all have a yearning to be somewhere else. Because we don't belong here. We're not the world's church. We're Christ's church. So let's look to Christ's letters to find out how to be his church. In chapter 1 of Revelation... We're going to go to the first church of Ephesus in chapter 2, but real quick. In the first um, chapter of Revelation, John, this would be the beginning of this letter that all the churches got. I wasn't sure I was going to read it, but I think it's really important for us. If this letter was written to those churches, just as much as it was written to our church, let's read what John has to say to Refuge Church. And John says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, 
write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. To Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. Like a son of man. That means his image was that of you and I. Clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. Have you ever been at the beach? I know I love to sit at the beach and just hear the waves roll in. Could you imagine the comforting voice of Christ rolling like the waves? Rhythm. It's smooth. It's comforting. You feel like you're at peace. Just from his words. Just from his tone of voice. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. We spoke in our last series about eternity. And about how when we get to eternity, when we get to the final kingdom, after the millennial kingdom, and, and it's the end, Satan is in the pit of fire, and there's no more pain, and there's no more darkness, and there's no more evil, and, and we're there. It says that the sun is gone, but Christ's very presence brings the light greater than the sun, and that's what John's telling us here. It says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Did you hear that? As though dead. Because he couldn't breathe. He couldn't move. He couldn't look. He just stood there, just on his knees. In just pure submission to Christ. But he laid his right hand on me. I get chills thinking of Christ touching me. Putting his hand on me. What does that feel like? To have the King of Kings, the Prince of Peace, to physically. And he said, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and I behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Right there for the things that you have seen, those, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So the repeated theme throughout this message and through the series will be there is no confusion with God. There is no confusion. If you're ever not sure what to do and you're wondering, Lord, I'm not sure what to do. You think you're telling me this and that. And I think the Lord's speaking to you. That's the enemy trying to trip you up. That's the enemy trying to get you to second guess. And he'll take what you love the most and make you second guess because there can't be anything wrong with putting my family first. That's not what Christ says. Right? Christ, Christ says, you put me first. Right? And in fact, to one of them, let the dead bury the dead. Right? You serve me first. So we go into the church of Ephesus in chapter 2. To give a little background very quickly for the church of Ephesus, what, where was Ephesus, right? We talk about these cities and they, they're like faraway lands. I, I could be talking about Lord of the Rings, right? They, they just seem so far off. They seem so just, were they real? <laughs> were, were, were these places true? I mean, yeah, you can go visit them, but is it really what the Bible says? Well, here's some extra biblical accounts of Ephesus. Ephesus was the fifth largest city in the Roman Empire. It was located in Western Asia Minor, or modern-day Turkey. And it was the key port connecting Asia Minor with North Africa and Asia Minor to Europe. So it was a pretty bustling port, pretty busy place. It was a very important location to the Roman Empire and for Christianity, or for what will become Christianity. 
Um, it was known and described on inscriptions found there, um, so inscriptions that are not modern, but from then, and it was called, and I quote, first and greatest of the metropolis. It was a city dedicated to the worship of the goddess Artemis, or Diana, depending on Greek or Roman or however you want to, what side you're coming from. Um, and it was home to what was called the Imperial Cult. And the Imperial Cult um, was a group of people, very well known, that would worship the empire, or worship the emperors, uh, worship these goddesses. They were very militant about it. Um, and they were strewn throughout Ephesus, many of the other ancient cities as well. Um, but the goddess Artemis was the goddess of fertility to them. So you can imagine, and I'll let your imagine take you, that imagination take you there. Um, you can imagine what they consider worship to be as the goddess of fertility. Um, multiple partners, many partners. They, they didn't really have that, but as we know from scripture, that, that grieves God's heart when we act and behave in those ways. But that is what Ephesus was. It was a hub for all of what's going on here. The church in Ephesus, or the church, the, the group of people, because remember our church is not our building, it's not the four walls, as thankful as we are for a building to be in and meet, this building is not the church, right? The church is us. <clears throat> so the church in Ephesus was a gathering held at the home of uh, Priscilla and Aquila, as we know from 1 Corinthians. Uh, and for, from 1 Corinthians, it talks about them opening up their home to have church there. And Paul also lived in Ephesus. We think from about 52 to 55 AD. Um, and he wrote at least two, if not more, of his letters as he lived in Ephesus. So a little background. And for us modern today, so what can we relate that to? I think San Francisco. That was the closest I can come up with. I was thinking Las Vegas, but it just really didn't hit it. But think San Francisco, right? Sexual immorality of all types running rampant. Um, a port city, a very important port city. Uh, idols and, and gods and goddesses, everything you can imagine and more. Um, California, where many people worship on the idol of Hollywood, right? So I think California, San Francisco, probably a pretty good modern day to think of if you're talking about this. So as we jump in to verses 1 through 3, we read, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. And that's why reading verse one or chapter 1 was so important. Right? They knew exactly who Christ was talking about because John let them know <laughs> who they were already. So he goes further into it. It says, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and have found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. What does Christ do? He lands on what were you doing right? How are you pleasing? Where am I happy? What are you doing that is storing your rewards in heaven? It's going out. And they're calling out these people who are preaching a false doctrine, who are pulling people away from the church. And as we know in end times, it says there will be a great apostasy or falling away from the faith. And that's what they were guarding against. They were guarding their congregation about the false doctrine of all this other garbage going on in Ephesus. And they were saying, not in our house, not in God's house. This will not happen. Right? It's great. It's awesome. We all should be doing it. However, it's a little bit of an issue. But as we know today, and this principle is taught even among children, the best way to encourage someone is not to jump right into what they're doing wrong and berating them and telling them how to fix it is to say, hey, let me encourage you in what you're doing right. And now let me correct and teach you about what you're not doing right. Okay. And so Christ continues um, in verse 4. And we'll go to about 5a. It says, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Or as some translations may have, you have abandoned your first love. The idea of first love here, we're not talking about the first love like your first boyfriend or girlfriend. It's not what they're talking about. But they mean by first love is 
your most important love, what you prioritize, what is burning in here when you're away. Right? We talked about what we yearn for, um, the home in heaven and not here on earth. And that's what he's talking about. Your first love, what's most important, what you prioritize. Me, that's what Jesus said. You've, you've abandoned me, right? He's not saying on purpose. Note that. He's not saying that you purposely and knowingly and willfully just threw me away. But what he's saying here is, or let me back up a bit, and I'll give you the Greek word. Maybe that'll, that'll help. The Greek word here for abandon is um, aphiomi. And what it means is to depart from one and leave him to himself so that all mutual claims are abandoned. We're getting so wrapped up with what we're doing for Christ that the attention to our relationship with Christ takes a hit. Can we all relate to that, church? We serve. We're doing good. We're doing the Lord's work. Nothing wrong with that. But even the enemy will use that to draw you from Christ. That's an easy one to get wrapped up in. I'm doing the Lord's work. I can't be the enemy. What? Let me tell you. The enemy knows every word better than any of you and I do. He's had far longer to study it than any of us have. He was God's favorite angel. That means at one point he hung on every word God spoke. At one point. Even if it was just to have a prideful heart to be envy of God. He knew it. He still does. Praise God he's not all knowing. Praise God he's not all powerful. Praise God he's not all present. He does know more than we do. He's more powerful than us on our own. So what God's saying here is he's saying, you're still doing the right things. You're still working in my name. But you have neglected our relationship. Okay? It tells us another place in scripture. It says, many will call on my name and say, look at the demons I drove out in your name. And look at all the works I did. And Jesus will say, I never never knew you. Take that in. Does Jesus know you? Yes, he knows you because he's all knowing, but does he know you because you told him you? Does he know you because you cultivated, had cultivated a relationship with him, right? Because the flip side of that relationship is not only does he know us, but we get to know him, right? And he told us that if we know him, then we know the Father our bridge. That relationship is the bridge that restores us back to the Father. That reconciles us back to a perfect union with God. Do we at times get wrapped up? As I said in the work of Christ that we overlook, of course we do. We're human here's the great thing. Jesus wouldn't be warning us if he didn't think we were going to do it. We're not surprising him when we forget to have quiet time today. We're not surprising him when the kids are screaming and you got to get out to work and somebody's got to get to school and everything falls apart and the next thing you know you're chewing the kids out and you're frustrated and you're aggravated you're pulling up to the school and it's pretty much tuck and run and get out of there, right? And he knows that's going to happen. He knew that was going to happen before you were born. So no, you're not surprising him. One of the greatest things someone ever told me uh, when I surrendered my life to Christ in 2013, they told me, Mark, don't worry, you will never disappoint God. He already knows he's on the other side of whatever you think you're disappointing. He already knows. He's already there. So the better thing about this message is Jesus doesn't leave us hanging, does he? Never. Never leaves us hanging. Not only does he correct us, and you know, this is something that I think I've fallen into many times with that about. As most of you know, I'm a stay-at-home dad and spend a lot of time with that little girl. Um, and I can tell you, she is just like me. That's really hard to deal with. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I know sometimes I correct Annabeth, and I'll 
she'll get in a timeout. I know, shocking, right? Kind of that feels the timeout. Um, but I'll put her in a timeout, and it'll click as I'm getting her out that I never even told her how to fix what she did wrong. So how could I possibly expect her to do it right next time, right? Discipline is there. I, I tell her it's wrong. I tell her not to do that. But if she doesn't know what to replace the behavior with, she's going to reach into her bag of tricks and get a new behavior. I'd rather tell her what behavior to choose. Just like God tells us what behavior to choose, right? So when we slip off and our relationship becomes stagnant, as it's going to do, trust me, as sure as I am standing here today, it is going to happen. That's why the Lord tells us it's going to happen. But he says... Go back to what you first did. It's not a mystery. Right? So many times we hear the book of Revelation and most of us go, oh boy, I ain't doing this. It's a confusing book. It's hard to read. There's a lot of words and ideas and imagery that it's like, where do I even begin? Right? But don't let yourself get overwhelmed. Confirm scripture with scripture. Look, look into God's word. He tells us his word is perfect. His word is the truth, right? It's the sword that comes out of his mouth. It is the only offensive weapon as Christians that we have against the enemy is the word of Christ. It's the word of God. So he tells us, remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. He's not even saying let me teach you something new. He's saying, hey, you know all that stuff you already knew how to do? Start doing it again. It's easy. It's funny. I tell Dan about it sometimes. It's this simple. And it's like it goes right over her head. Right? Actually, today, she stopped or did something. And I said, Annabeth, you know, she did over and over again. I said, please stop, please stop. And I finally said, Annabeth, we stopped down the stairs again. We're going to go over her timeout today. And she melted down. Melted down. I said, Annabelle, it is so simple. Just stop doing what you're doing. It's that simple, right? For whatever reason, it just went over her head. And she thought I was going to put her in timeout right now. That's not what I said. How many times are we like that with God? Right? But God, but God, but God. And God's going, can you just hear what I'm saying? We can just shut up and listen? Right? I know that sounds harsh. But let's think back to Jonah. Right? How did God do with Jonah? Oh, is it you that created that plant? When Jonah got all mad that his plant got eaten up, he had to sit in the sun and, and bake as he watched Nineveh get saved. And he was still upset. Right? Sometimes I think God has to do that with us. He's got to be a little sarcastic. He's got to put us in our place. Right? I know I need to be put in my place multiple times. So there it is. It's, it's the fix. No mystery. He's not asking you to learn anything new. He's not asking you to follow some new teaching or make it confusing or, hey, jump to this book and that book and the other book and take a little bit here and just do what you were doing. And we'll get back to where we were. So great. He corrects us with a fix. With a fix. And then he provides us with a warning. And this warning is not a threat. I know a lot of times it's easy for us as humans to think of warnings as threats, right? Like when I told Adam, you keep doing it, you're going to go to time out. I wasn't threatening her with time out. I was informing her that if her behavior continued, she would not be happy. And this is why she would not be happy. And it was used as an incentive for her to behave the way she was behaving before she acted out, right? It's the same thing. It's, just, it's that simple, Right? So he tells us, oh, I lost my place here, in verse 5, at the end of it. If not, if you don't do this, if you don't go back to what you were doing, if you don't fix this relationship, sorry, if you don't fix this relationship, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. We hear this word repent. It sounds like a very Christianese word, right? It's 
really, it's really not. <laughs> uh, repent means to stop what you're doing, right? Here's where we all get hung up. And to turn around 180 degrees and move away, right? Not turn around and stay there with your back towards it. Don't ignore it. Christ is saying reject it by moving away from it, right? Move away from the behavior. And that's why we don't just repent once, right? We repent um, as our sins and admit that we're sinners and ask Christ for his righteousness because that's all we can do. But throughout our sanctification process, as we perfect our faith, we may go through many times of repent, right? We're human. Being a Christian doesn't mean you're not a sinner anymore. Being a Christian doesn't mean that all of a sudden you prayed a prayer and now you've got all the knowledge of God in your head. No, we don't eat from the, apple, from the tree of knowledge, right? We, that's not how it goes. We're still sinners. We still mess up. We still make mistakes. We still get loud or yell or we're on the highway and get cut off. And I'm sure we're all praying for the person in front of us, right? <laughs> Lord, take care of my enemies, right? <laughs> David comes to mind when someone cuts us off on the highway. But we all need a little work. So he warns us. I'm going to take your lampstand out of its place. Fix the relationship or we have nothing left to talk about. Fix the relationship. Know me and I'll know you so that when you stand in front of my father I know him, Dad. I died for him. He's covered under my So that's the warning. Right? It's not a threat. As I said last week, he's not up there with an eternal game of a game of whack-a-mole, waiting for us to pop up so he can bang us back down into place, right? He's not doing that. He says, hey, I know you're gonna make mistakes. I'm gonna give you some incentive and encouragement in a book that you can read anytime you like. But I know you're gonna make the mistakes, and here's how to go about not, and here's what's gonna happen if you do make them. Right? As I say, Christianity is an open book test. Right? God says, choose me, and you'll have life, and life more abundant. Right? I have many people come to me and say, Mark, why do I have to be a Christian? I have, I have my life. My life is great. I have a family. I have a job. I have all I can ever ask for. What more can Christ give me? Right? But Christ doesn't just say he'll give us life. He says, if you've got a good life, great. He'll make it more abundant. Right? For Christians, our life here on earth is as bad as it's going to get. For those that aren't Christians, this life is as good as it's going to be. So he gives us our warning in hopes that we'll make the right choice. And so to round it out, in verse 6, he gives them encouragement. And the encouragement is, yet this you have. He said, hey, I've got this issue. But you got this going with you towards this issue, right? Got this going for you. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So what Christ is saying is, no matter how far we have strayed, we've got a common ground, right? You're hating the same evil that I hate. That's a great common ground to have with God, right? To not be embracing the false doctrine and the evil that's going on around you and that is pulling people away from salvation. So who are the Nicolaitans? It's another one of those names we hear in the Bible. We read it, we glaze over it. We really don't know who these ancient people were. And to be honest, we don't have a lot of information about them. Um, they are believed to be a sect of Christianity pushed forth by um, an ancient um, Christian theologian, I guess you could say his name was Nicholas. Um, he kind of went off the deep end so to speak. And here's where the church of Ephesus is a direct relationship to Refuge Church in Robinsville, New Jersey in 2022. Because the Nicolaitans took Christianity and they took the world's religions and the culture and the rules and the popularity and, and everything the world was doing and they said, this is great. We'll just take Jesus, and we'll take this, and we'll mash them together, and we'll have I, Jesus, right? Fully customizable Christ. We'll take the Thomas Jefferson approach, 
to Christianity and cut everything out of the Bible that we don't like and we paste it back in our own Bible with all the nice comfy parts that we do like and that's what we'll believe. And Jesus is saying here is no. No. This is the word of God. Any part of this book without the rest of it is not the gospel. I don't care if you take John and you add it to the Quran, it's not gospel. I don't care if you take Matthew and you add it to Robbinsville Municipal Building's Rules of Conduct, it's not the gospel. Just because you insert a piece of scripture into something does not turn it into God's word. It doesn't. But our, how often does our world do that every single day? Not to call out on any groups, but we see this in, with the Jehovah's Witness religion. They switch words in Scripture. Little ones will turn an of to a for, and, but it changes the whole message of Scripture. You can't change the Word of God because it is then the Word of man, and the Word of man is empty and hollow and has no foundation. And then we come into the last verse, verse 7. And here are where the rewards and the results happen. Right? And as I read this, keep note, another point to show us that this letter went to all of them, including us here today. It tells us in verse 7, He who has an ear, let him hear. Do we all have ears today? Good? Yes? Everybody? No? Alright. So if we have ears, he's talking to us, right? He says, those who have ear, let him hear, or her ear, what the Spirit says to the church. The Spirit. The same Spirit that lives in each one of us. The same Spirit that took Christ off the cross. The same Spirit have resurrected Christ in human form and ascended into heaven and worked power through the apostles and worked power through the first century Christians and who works power through pastors in Africa to this day as they cast out demons and they perform healings and things that we don't see in America. We're conditioned to believe that the supernatural is nothing but a fairy tale. But it's not. It might not be all aliens and ghosts, but it's Christ. And it's God and it's angels. It's still supernatural to us. It's outside of the earth. It's outside of time and space and matter. And so it's super to our natural, right? And it says, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat off the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. It doesn't say to the church, Right? Not collective. It's talking to you as individuals. Right? Because the church is us. So he's saying if you have an ear and you hear and you conquer this and you come back to me and you re reconcile and restore this relationship that we had and, and, and we're spending time together, it's saying, hey, you will eat off the tree of life. God's paradise. Have a relationship with me, right? Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. I'm not religious. People tell me, oh, I'm religious. I'm like, Wonderful. I'm not. Right? Christ isn't religious. In fact, Christ bucked religious. Christ said, take religious and get it out of here. Go to the people. I'm here for the sick, not for the health. So those are the rewards and the results following, as I said earlier, the design of what the church is supposed to be. As a church, we need to get back to our first love. And not only get back to our first love, but we need to stay with our first love. When we walk outside of His grace, or we, we start to compromise, and we'll get into the compromising church next week, but then we start to do those things, it eats away and it chips away at the relationship that we have. 
right? We're starting to let the world in and the world the world comes in, Jesus comes out he, because as although our brains are the biggest and most complex biomechanical computer in the world, so if you tell me it wasn't designed and somehow a bag of cells randomly over a billion years formed this amazing brain that can hold more memory than all the supercomputers in the world combined this day, Tell me that happens without design. I really don't know where to begin. I don't think that it happens by accident. It says if we do this as a church, we get back the results that will happen. And that brings us to our weekly focus for this week. And our weekly focus is let's get back to our quiet time, right? Last week we talked about getting back to church. We talked about being in this season, being September in New Jersey, of getting back. Well, let's add another thing to get back to. Let's get back to our first love. So in our quiet time this week, when you're spending time with God or however that looks for you, let this be a part of it. Personalize it. Have I lost or am I losing my first love? Am I losing sight of the relationship that I have with Christ? Am I, am I neglecting Christ, even if it is to do his work? Even if I am about my father's business, by not spending time with my father. So am I lost or am I losing my first love? Let's really personalize that this week. And then let's ask the Spirit in our prayer time to remind, to reveal, and to empower us to return back to the things that we were doing that fed the fire of the desire to be close to Christ. The fire that is in our hearts the yearning and the longing because this is not where we belong. Let's be in the world, not of the world, right? For greater who is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Let me pray for us today. Heavenly Father, Sovereign God of all creation, you are the uncaused first cause you sit on the throne. There is nothing that has been created that you have not created. We recognize, we acknowledge, and we proclaim your kingship over the church, over our lives individually. Lord God, we ask you that you can empower us that as we go out into the world to draw the lost to you, that we don't neglect our relationship with you, Lord. We long to be with you. We want to be home with you, Lord. But as we are here, let us take the mission and the great commission that you have given us and let it burn inside our hearts to complete it with fervor, with urgency. If these are the last days, Lord, we want to make sure that all of the earth can hear your gospel. As you have told us in Scripture, until every ear hears the good news. Father, empower us. Reveal to us those that are searching so that we can meet your divine appointments with boldness, with love, with compassion, and with your word, your unadulterated, your unmolested word. Father, we pray for those that are not here with us tonight. We pray a prayer over our sister Patty, Lord, as she recovers from her surgery and as she deals with this sinus infection, Father, you tell us to bring all cares to you. We know that only if it is under your will that those prayers and cares will be answered. And Lord, we trust that if you tell us to bring our cares, that we will. So we will ask for a healing on Patty right now. That you will put your hands upon her and that her nose will feel better. That her head will be less cloudy and less stuffy. And that she will feel the hand of your peace that surpasses all understanding on her body, Lord. Encourage her, lift her spirits, and bring her back to the fold of church us next week, Father. And Lord, we praise you for what you have done in Beth's life, how you have taken this surgery that was not healing, and that you have placed your hand on her to leaps and bounds, that there is no more problems, that the surgery went well, and that there is healing over her body, Lord. And we thank you for that, that her spirits are raised, that you have led Hank in the direction of how to care for her, and you have supplied them with the needs and with the resources that they need. 
Father, we thank you for bringing Wendy back to us tonight as she traveled to go get Chris and Jess. We pray a prayer of blessing over them, Father. We pray a prayer of blessing over Mercer County, Father, greater Mercer County, Robbinsville Baptist Church, Refuge Church, the Bridge, ERC, Lord. We pray a prayer of blessing over the network of churches that you have allowed to be in this place to reach everyone in your name and for the betterment of your kingdom. So we pray all of this, Lord. We lift it all up to you and we surrender and submit ourselves according to your will. We thank you for the resources and provisions that you have provided for our meal this evening, and we pray a prayer of blessing over that as well. And in Jesus' name, all believers said, Amen. Amen. Amen.